right, uh, let's get this thing started. Good morning, hope you guys had a good coat on the beach this weekend. No sunburns, no hangovers, no red eyes. That's a good thing. So my name is John Papa and I'm going to talk to you about some angular patterns today. I promised 10, you're getting 10% chipped because I decided to cut one out. <laughs> you can complain to management. All right, so we'll talk about a few things here today. Specifically, I'd like to kind of retitle this talk a little bit more about things I wish I knew when I got started. I mean, everything has this really nice entry path that's popular, or at least most things are popular, a nice entry path. And once you get going with Angular, you realize there's some things that, you know, well, while it looks really good in a one-page demo that you saw at a big conference, maybe it doesn't work so well when you start applying it to a larger application. So this talk could kind of hit on some of those things that maybe can help you out as you get started. A quick show of hands, how many people here have worked with Angular? Cool. We got a couple newbies, mostly uh, have some experience. So first off, I like to hand out all the demos that I give. So everything you're going to see here today will be up at this GitHub repo uh, and much, much more. I have a habit of putting all my demos out there and they kind of evolve over time. So everything you're going to see is going to be up there and you can play with it. Uh, and I'll show this again. So if you don't get this right now, no worries. Uh, there is a $10 donation button on the site. No, I'm just kidding. So again, I mentioned you know, the gamification of Angular. It's a really cool term that a friend of mine coined for this. And I really like this term because it kind of shows that we have this mentality about code and development that when we start coding and we get a win early, we feel like we got points, you know? So we keep going and going and going. It's an early positive feedback. Kind of like, you know, you're putting the uh, rat in the maze and you're giving a little bit of cheese along the way. And you get results quickly, and that really makes you feel pretty darn awesome. I mean, who doesn't feel awesome? They get results quickly, right? But sometimes you're going to, you know, hit walls. Not everything is perfect. And this is usually me in the morning. <laughs> so today, this is all about making us get back to that kind of more of a stable, positive feeling of feeling good about ourselves in Angular. So what kind of tips can we run through? Well. First, let's talk about that scale as you start learning Angular. Some of you are new to it, so you're going to go through this. I don't want to ruin it for you, but when you start doing Angular, you're going to think, wow, data binding rocks, it's awesome, you know? And a couple minutes later, you're going to go, man, I wish I could go back to jQuery. That's just so much better. And yeah, it kind of goes ups and downs and ups and downs. And eventually, you start wondering how you're going to tell your boss you can back out of this thing. And oh, man, what was that Silverlight thing? You know? So. The good news is after a while, you're going to feel like Angular really rocks, and you're going to kind of run with it. But building large-scale apps does take a lot of planning. So we're going to talk about some of the things that I've learned that kind of help you build large-scale applications. Probably the number one thing I get asked about is how do you structure your application? John, how do you do it? What's the right way? First of all, there is no right way. Everything I'm showing you here today is a way that works. Pick a way, run with it. If somebody tells you you're doing something wrong with structuring your application, just nod your head and move along. It's not worth it. So the two main themes in structuring your app are by type and by feature. And you'll hear other terms for this too, like function. But by type is usually what you'll see in a lot of the generators, like the Yeoman generator that's out there for Angular. It's really great, but it creates everything by type. And what that means is you're stuck with a structure something like this. All your controllers, services, and views kind of go in their own folders, directives, filters, and so on. And in some cases, they don't create folders for these things. They just create a file, like directives.js and filters.js, controllers.js, where you stick every controller in one place. Again, great for getting started in simple demos, but it gets harder and harder to refactor that. What happens when you have that 100-page you know, application? You know, We're not building single-page apps, right? Or wait, we are. So yeah, but you're building all these apps with lots of views out there. So you want to break these things up sometimes in a way that's easier for you to read. The computer doesn't care how you store your files, right? The browser is going to look at some minified file at the end of it. It doesn't care how you store them. So pick a way that's easy for your team. I happen to like the one on the right a little bit more. So by type is you know, put everything in by type that it goes through. By feature is more by what you're working on. What are your user stories that you're trying to develop? I'm building a dashboard. I'm building something with people, customers, orders, whatever. 
and then maybe have like a shared or a services folder for things that are shared throughout the application. That's a good, good way to start things out. And the nice thing about this is as you start to expand, and one of my tips is about how you can expand it, it actually lends itself more easily to expanding your application as you grow. I'm a big fan of Yagni. Do we know what Yagni means? You ain't going to need it. So you ain't going to need it means don't develop for something you're not sure you're going to need. And it sounds like common sense, but how often do you hear this in the room? Well, what if we need to stop right there? We don't need to do the what ifs. Do the things you need to do for your user stories. And just don't put yourself in a position where you can't expand later. So there's a couple options we talked. We talked about by type, folders, reviews, and controllers, by feature. But there's also a hybrid. My good friend Dan Wallin likes this hybrid, and I like it too. Somewhere in the middle. You can do folders by feature and then by type as well. So let's say your feature gets large. You start creating a feature for a customer uh, entry. You're creating, a, sorry, order entry. Creating orders in your application. You've got lots of screens and things moving around. You've got like 20 files in there. Maybe just break that subfolder out by the type if you want, when a feature can't be broken out. So doing some kind of hybrid is good. And the key is being able to make your code locatable and easy to find. And this all follows with, you saw the keynote I did, uh, I think it was Friday, which feels like 100 years ago right now. Um, follows the same structure I always look at, which I call a lift. It's basically locating your code and identifying your code. Those are the two biggest things I look for when I look through code bases. A lot of my job is to look and help pair program with other people. And when I look and click at their code, if I can go in there quickly and identify what's going on, it just makes life easy. And it's not like everybody codes like me. They don't. Everybody has their own structure and style. But the ones who do follow this kind of plan of locating, identifying your code easy, makes it a lot easier to pair. So how do you define that? Let's look at an example. So here's a common demo starting structure. I've got app.js as my main module. I've got a service to get some data. And I've got a view and a controller. Pretty simple. I hate when I see a structure like this and I see like 12 folders and five files. And people are trying to yag me again. Start slow, you know, you can always refactor. And then what happens when you start adding just a few more features? All I did here was add some directives, a logging service, and then a new screen and a controller, and then a spinner and some local storage. But it's getting a little bit crowded. So what do I do at this point? Well, I've got to run that 10 file area. Now I'm going to add a folder for the services because I happen to have four things that can be shared throughout the app. So now I create a folder for it. And I might even make that folder a module, an Angular module. You can plug and play. OK, but now it's starting to get a little more uncomfortable. I've got the services folder. But I've added in a whole thing about sessions up here. Uh, I've got people and attendees and speakers. And I've got a bunch of layout. Don't forget about your layout. Your app's going to have that as well, like a sidebar, a menu, a footer, and your content areas. So what do you do then? Well, hard to read at this point, but you can see we get folder structures for all these areas. So you start breaking these things out as you go. Not hard to do if you do it incrementally. So you just keep it to a structure that makes it easy to find things. And that's kind of the best recommendation I can give you on that. So we've already kind of seen a little bit of a glimpse of some of the patterns I like here in that first section, because the second tip is all about data patterns. I like to follow a principle called the single responsibility principle, or separation of concerns. It's one of the policies. Basically, I like my controllers to be dealing with just what they should deal with, which is handling the information for the view. What does the view need? It should not be dealing with data calls to services and factories. Sorry, it should be deferring them to services and factories. All your data, your XHR, should be isolated. One of the reasons for this is there's several ways to get to your data. You might, your data might be in local storage. Your data might be in a SOAP service. It might be in a JSON service. You might be using dollar sign resource or dollar sign HTTP or Breeze or some other feature to go get that data. How you get the data is something the controller should not be concerned with. The fact that it needs the data is what it should be concerned with. Go get customers. Tell somebody else to go get it. Have a service go get that for you. And then guess what? All of a sudden you're testable and you can mock those services. So how might that look? So here's an example of a data service. It's a factory. Factories and services are pretty interchangeable in Angular, slight differences. And a factory here creates a service, a singleton, which everybody can share. And it's got a method in here called get my data and one called save. Right at the top, I can see what it's going to do for me. And then in my controller, the way I call that, 
is I just say, okay, go ahead and get my data, service.getMyData. The simplest way to get your data is to use dollar sign HTTP. If you've used jQuery's Ajax features, it's basically a wrapper on top of it. Uh, one thing people get burnt on a lot is they try to continue to use jQuery's Ajax features with Angular, and then all of a sudden their data is not showing up on the screen. One of the reasons for that is Angular has a thing called a digest cycle, which it runs through and detects changes. If you use jQuery's Ajax to go get your data and come back and just bind it to your screen, you're not always going to see the data. And part of that is Angular hasn't kicked off its digest cycle because it doesn't know you got data. So that's when you have to run the digest cycle. Or if you use dollars in HTTP, it automatically tells Angular when things come back. So it's a good, uh, good habit to get into to just use that service. And the way this works is pretty simple. The API is http.get. What am I getting? This URL. And then if it works, I say then return what? Beta.results or whatever your data looks like. And if it doesn't, then you can do something with the error message. And the key here is to return this data. Another big mistake people make is notice that second line of code, the return in front of the HTTP get. If you leave that out and you call this code from your controller, your controller will not know when the promise has been resolved. It's asynchronous. It has to go off to a server, get data, and come back. That return tells whoever's talking to it, I will let you know when the data's back. It'll still work, and the network calls will still work, and everything else will be fine if you don't do that, but you may not see your data. So in your controller, you'll do something like this. Call my Avengers data service, get my Marvel Avengers, and then there's the callback for it. When I get that promise, go ahead and pull out my data, bind it to my screen, and I'm done. So one thing I want to make sure you understand about this little tip here is you do not want to put data access in your controller. If you see that in there, you should look like this guy and rip it out immediately. It's Caddyshack reference. So another big thing I'm a fan of is exception handling patterns. You want to make sure that you handle all of the problems in your application in an elegant way. Now, what you do with it is kind of up to you as far as you want to log it, just print the console, send it off to a server, and put it into a database. But you need a way to kind of catch them all. And one way to do that is to consistently in your application is using something called a decorator. So Angular exposes this exception handler service. And by default, the exception handler service just handles exceptions for you pretty ungracefully. But you can extend it. So what I've done here, and this is in the code base we'll look at, is you can write a decorator. You use the dollar sign provide. That's a service that Angular exposes, and it's got a decorator. And you say, what service do I want to decorate? And decorating basically means take the service in its existing state and then do something else too. So it's basically saying, don't stop what the service does now, but also have it do this. So I say, OK, Mr. Decorator, what do you want to do? And at that point, my decorator can you know, print message to the screen in a pop-up, write to a database, write to local storage, crash the machine, whatever you want to do to it. <laughs> so if we take a look, let me exit this show. So we've got a couple of samples here. Up inside of the ng demos folder, this thing's called a modular application. And then there's under client and app, you'll see a thing called blocks. There's an exception block. And here's my exception block that I handle. And what I've got down here is my decorator on line 30, right there highlighted. I'm saying, OK, go ahead and decorate my exception handling service. And then inside of there, I'm passing in delegate. I'm going to need that down here so I can actually delegate the exception make sure it handles the same thing. It's kind of like a base class calling itself. And then we've got the error data. So I'm adding in this error information. And then I'm also calling my logger service. So on line 42, I've written my own little logging service. And I'm saying, in addition to handling exceptions the way you normally do, call my logger service. It's got an error method on it. And then I'm deferring how to log off to him. So again, it's separating out my concerns. My logger does one thing. And that's actually going to display messages to the screen when there is an error. So if I come into my application and I caused an error, we'd see little pop-ups and things. Like down here in the corner, you can see a little toast popping up. When I have an error and other messages, those will pop up in red when I have an issue. 
Of course, my code never has issues, so it's not going to pop up red. <laughs> People at work would laugh at that one. Or cry, one of the two. <laughs> so tip number four. We're a third of the way through. Modularity. John, what happens when I get large apps? I have an application at work that's been in the works for seven years and it's got 4,000 screens. How do I build that in Angular? First thing you do is don't build one app that has 4,000 screens. <laughs> um, and it is possible to take those kind of apps and build slices out of them. One of the great things about Angular and the web is that we can take a section of an existing application on the web today, just one section with a couple screens, and build an Angular app top to bottom, a vertical slice of it, and then put it in place on top of the existing app. So when it just goes to that one section, the user doesn't even know they're in the new Angular app. So it's a great way you can seamlessly start to roll out new parts of your application over time, as opposed to writing that 4,000 screen application. And the way you do that, and the secret to it, is with these building blocks called modules in Angular. So each module can contain all sorts of functionality like services or widgets, directives, filters, all of these things. What goes in there depends upon you and your user stories. And modules can depend upon other modules, which is great. You want to make sure that they're isolated so they work on their own, if they need to be working on their own. And it really promotes that continuous development um, profile. So you create a module, and in that module you might have configuration and routes and filters and everything that module needs to actually operate. So how do you define a module? It's, uh, it's funny how some of the Simplest one-line pieces of code are the ones that are most misunderstood, too. When you create a module, this is how you create it. This is the setter. There's a subtle difference between this and this. And it's that second parameter. That's a getter, the second parameter. The first one is saying, go ahead and create this module called my app, and it has no dependencies. Just by putting in that second parameter, it's telling you it doesn't exist, go create it. The second one says, go get this module called my app. So even if you have no dependencies, you still have to put that little square braces in there. Now if you have dependencies, you do something more like this. In this particular case, I'm defining a module called app. And this is my standard, what I do. I'll create a root module, which really has no functionality. My root module is like a wrapper. It has no directives or controllers or shells or anything else. It's just a module and with some configuration, which then depends upon all of my features. In this way, as I roll in new features, I can just add them to this list and they'll just appear in the application. So I might have a feature for Avengers, one for Dashboard, one for all my widgets or directives, one for the layout. And this means before you load the app module, load all these other guys. And they are not uh, order dependent, so you can put them alphabetical or whatever, or any other order you want to do them in. If you have third-party modules, you can put those in here as well. So you might uh, depend upon UI Bootstrap, a very popular um, Angular module to link in with Bootstrap features. Breeze Angular, if you like data access. And you can write your own modules. And you can also link into Angular modules like ng route. Word of advice on naming. If you create a module, don't name it ng something. Uh, there's a lot of third-party models out there, not a lot, but enough where they're naming it the same as Angular does, and it gets confusing then on which ones Angular wrote and which ones somebody else wrote. So generally pick your own naming convention. So let's say you're building an application in a modular fashion. You create that main modular app, and the first thing you're generally going to do is create some kind of layout. What's the menu structure going to look like? How's it organized? So we create a separate module for layout. And then maybe you go create a dashboard because your users really want to see that dashboard app. So if somebody else in your team creates a dashboard. So over here you're creating a dashboard, over here you're creating the layout. And then you can plug those into the module as you need it. Then you realize you've got some reusable components you want to plug in. So somebody creates the widgets module for all those shareable uh, UI controls. Well, once you get to a couple of these, you start realizing uh, a couple of these guys need to access data on the back end. And I don't want to be repeating my XHR calls and all these. So maybe I create a module called core or common, something like that. And that module has all my data services in it. They're shared throughout the application. So now, dashboard and layout would depend upon core because they want to go back and get information about the Avengers. And then maybe all those guys, what I do in core is I put down anything that's used by the entire app just because it's a single place to put it. 
Then somebody comes in a month later and says there's a new user story to add the Avengers module. So I'll add that in. It plugs right in, just goes into core, just like that. And of course you can add in other Angular features too. But building this kind of structure makes it nice and easy to expand as you go. All right. So the fifth tip is all about controllers, which have three L's. Look at that. <laughs> it's the controller pattern. What are controllers? Again, one of the most often misunderstood pieces of Angular. Controllers are effectively constructors. Every time you get a controller, you get a new one. When a controller goes away, it goes away, it's destroyed. It's not shared. If you create three um, instances of a controller, you're creating three brand new instances and you can only have access to one. You're not sharing data across them. Unlike a service or factory where it's a singleton and you share it. So this is one of the reasons controllers are often uppercased. They're Pascal case in the front. People realize that they are actually being created new. This is just a regular JavaScript constructor. It creates a new instance. When I say create a new Avenger, that's a new instance. A controller does the same kind of thing. This is a controller in Angular. Notice a very similar structure here. Just the top, it says, okay, make this constructor be a controller for me. And I've got this thing called scope. Scope is what helps us bind between the view and the controller. There's also a syntax called controller as, which I happen to prefer, and I'll show you both of these. And one of the reasons I like that is it actually allows me to get rid of that scope variable. And the scope variable is not a bad thing, but it can be misused. Why can the scope be misused? Because there's a lot of things it does besides just data binding. So in the bottom of the syntax, you're basically just saying, go get the this variable. And the reason I capture this, has anybody uh, ever been bitten by this in JavaScript, or this keyword? A couple of you? Yeah. So on a simple example like this, really doesn't make any sense to use var vm equals this. I do it for consistency there, but if you actually create nested closures, which are functions inside of your functions, the scope and context of this changes to whatever that closure is. So if you want that to be the view model, the scope, by capturing it right when you know it's the scope, you know that VM is always going to be what you're binding to. But if I just use the this keyword everywhere, this is actually going to be a different object all over the place. So this way I know this is what I want it to be. So what does scope do beyond data binding? Just a few things. And once you have scope inside your controller by passing it in, I tend to look at a lot of people's code and they start using scope all over the place, doing things in their controller that perhaps the controller shouldn't be doing. You maybe don't want the controller doing digest cycles on its own and creating new watches and all this other stuff inside there. And once it's there, it's just easy to kind of use it. So by eliminating the scope from the controller, kind of going back to this technique, which is on the bottom, it makes it harder for somebody to accidentally start using scope. Now, just because you haven't put scope in there doesn't mean you can't use it. You can still use it. In effect, this is exactly what your scope is right now. This var vm is your scope. So you can bind to it, which is the key of what you want to do in a controller. So here's a good example of another reason I like the controller as. What happens when you have nested controllers? First of all, you want to shoot somebody for calling everything name. But let's say you've got views like this, where you've got a shell, which means your outer shell, and it's got a name for the application, a name for the view, maybe it's your customer view, and then a name for the customer, and then a name for the actual order. What name is going to be displayed? Will that even work? Yeah, it'll work, but it gets kind of confusing. This is a little bit easier to read with a dot syntax. So by putting actual dots in there, it actually helps you out. Plus, there's a bug in the code I just showed you. Let me explain. So if we come out of here, and we'll go back over to Sublime. Here is a nice little application which does nesting. And what I've got here is a shell scope and a customer scope. I only went too deep. Now if you look at the code for this guy, you can see up top, I've got a controller here on line four for shell, and then I've got a model for title, and a controller for customer, and a model for title. And inside my actual JavaScript, which is in the same view as the HTML, 
which is, again, demo code here. Don't do that. But we've got this down here. We've got our scope being injected, and we're setting title. And down here, we have another controller. We're setting the title. Sorry, name. There is no title down here. Notice, no title. Now, if we flip back over here, because we're referring to title on both of those, if I say title one, two, three, look what happens. Everybody's getting updated. I actually wanted the customer to have his own title. But because I didn't set the title inside my controller, it just inherited the title from the outer scope. Probably not what I wanted in this case. One way to avoid that is to always set your properties in your controllers, but it's still kind of a strange behavior you don't want to have happen. But notice now I'm typing in here, and that's in sync. What happens if I come down to customer scope and I start typing in, like, Madeline? Notice the outer one didn't get affected. Now it says, oh, OK, I don't have to inherit anymore. I've got my own, so I'll use mine. Boy, your users are going to love this inconsistent behavior. <laughs> so Just, you go back and type in the first one now? If I type in the first one? Okay. They're completely in sync the way you thought they would be now. Yeah, users love this kind of stuff. So how do you fix that? You don't use that code. That's the first thing. Now we've got a shell on the outside, and now we've got this thing called a vm.title. I'm still using plain old scope, but now I've just got a dot. This little dot is very powerful. And the only thing I've done here is change it, so both these guys do a vm dot. And down in my code, what I've done is I still inject scope, but instead of putting title right on scope, I put it on another object. It's like a model. It's a view model. I'm saying, go ahead and create a view model. This is the data I want you to expose. And again, I have no title down here. No title. So in this exa example, I actually have to run the example, don't I? Open browser. Doo, 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 doo. In this example, notice we don't get a title down here. So I can type in up here, one, two, three, and it's exactly what you think. And down here, I can type in Maddie, and it's perfect. Go back up there, type in Joe, we're good. So it actually behaves the way you want it to. But who wants to be doing this? Right? Right, John. So here's controller as, and in controller as syntax, slightly different, you get VM. You're basically saying, use my controller called shell, and inside my HTML, I'm going to refer to that scope as VM. You immediately get this dot syntax for free. So you get the same code up top again, as we did in the previous one. And at the bottom, instead of injecting scope, notice what's missing there. No scope. Now I say var VM equals this, and VM.title, shell title. And down here again, there's no title. Not title, whatever. And if I run that baby, do, 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 shell title up here. I can type in one, two, three. Down here, I can type in Maddie, and we are good. I come back up here, I can type in Joe, still good. So the controller as syntax gives you that functionality for free and protects you from the dangers of not having dots. Because you don't have to do dots when you do the regular dollar sign scope. You can simulate it. What I effectively did in number two is I simulated having the controller as syntax. So let's not stop there. Let's create a fake controller as example. So now I'm using scope just to show you as a demo what you really get when you use controller as because the first question people ask me is, well, if I use controller as, do I just lose scope entirely? No, it's still there. Effectively what's happening under the covers with controller as is this. They're still injecting scope for you. You wouldn't have to do that. But they're basically saying, create a variable on your object, on your scope, and let it represent this. So that way, every time I decorate this VM object, I'm actually decorating it on scope. So it's a level of abstraction which helps you not worry about the reference issue that we had with the first example. But again, you don't want to keep typing dollar sign scope dot something dot property name. So the way I recommend this is to actually use the controller as syntax, which is like that. Ah. John, how does that work with routing? I mean, you don't have a controller uh, code. Good question. So how do you do that with routing? You don't. You have to write a one-page app. Just kidding. So up in Avengers, too early for that joke, right? I'm leaving. So here we go. In our route, we say controller, and then they've got this controller as parameter. And it's also a little different in tests. So let's see if I've got a test in here. Anybody here write unit tests? One person? Cool. <laughs> Must get a lot of work. 
So here's an Avenger spec, blah, 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 blah. Where's my controller? There she is. See line 44? When I create a con uh, unit test with a controller as, I just say controller as whatever. And then inside of my controller c test, I can say things like scope vm.title. So the tests are slightly different, but you can still access it. Here's a great bug, by the way. Watch this. This is cool. This actually bit me one day. So I did this. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to try out controller as. This is awesome. Then I'm going to go into my view for my Avengers, and I'm going to type in here ng controller equals uh, Avengers. I think it's Avengers as VM. Is it plural? Let's see. It is plural. So I'm effectively creating a controller in my view. And in my route, I'm creating a controller. So what happens in this application when I run? Let's refresh. And let's go to the Avengers page. Look at that ev activated Avengers, activated Avengers. If you didn't have this toast here, you probably wouldn't even know that. I debugged an app recently where somebody actually had about 10 of these in there. Um, long story how they got 10 of them in there, but they saw all these toasts. They put it in Toaster one day and popped them up. I'm like, see, Toaster has value. It shows you all the bugs that you got in your code. It's actually creating two instances of the controller now. You want to pick one way to create your controllers, either using controller as in the route or in the view, not both. So I've got to go back to my code and fix this. Otherwise, I will probably push this in, to GitHub. And someone will wonder why I write crappy code. <laughs> That's my next course, crappy code. <laughs> I could actually write a pretty good one of those. Good segue into clean code. <laughs> So there's a lot of tips I could give here. I mean, the keynote kind of applies to a lot of the stuff that I talked about. But one thing I am not a big fan of in the Angular world, which it's actually kind of cool that you can do it, but you can actually, in some cases, nest like four levels of anonymous functions and write really concise code with Angular. But that kind of makes it messy after a while. Again, all these are demos that fit into an inch on the screen, so it looks wonderful. But once you start creating real code, it's not so clean. And for example here, what we've got now is we've got a nested function for the controller. This is great, but what happens when your controller has like seven parameters? And it's got like 100 lines of code, and then it's got its own nested things. It kind of gets drawn out. And this little anonymous function can actually cause you a headache when you're debugging, too. Because when you're debugging, how do you know what function broke? A simple thing I like to do is chaining. So I like to chain angular.module.controller like I did up top. But instead of actually putting the function in line, I refer to the function. So the function is just down below. First, it indent, de-indents, whatever. Moves it to the left, right? So it moves it to the left, and it puts it over here where I can actually deal with it. Gives it a name so I can debug it easier and handle it. So when the errors actually occur, I can know where in the call stack I am. And by doing this, you're actually taking advantage of hoisting. Now, some of you read uh, JavaScript, the good parts. I just said hoisting bad, right? Bad hoisting. What is he talking about? Hoisting in JavaScript means that when JavaScript sees a function like this, it says, I'm going to hoist up to the top of that closure this function. Make it available to everybody. So it's not an error to refer to this function before it's actually defined because it's going to be hoisted. Function hoisting, my mind, OK, no problem. There's something called variable hoisting. That's a bad thing. Never declare a variable way down in your code, because it'll hoist the variable definition, but not the value. So you'll be able to use it anywhere in your code, but the value won't be set till you actually get to it. So somebody says to you, hey, why are you doing hoisting? John Papa told me to. Well, that's a bad thing. Variable hoisting bad, function hoisting's OK. And it actually makes for cleaner code, because now, right at the top of my code when I open it up, I can see the controller name. I can see what it's doing, see its dependencies, and then all the details can be implemented down below. So what else can we do? How about global variables? Everybody loves global variables, don't they? Memory leaks are awesome. How do you avoid global variables in Angular? Well, there's one global you want to keep. That's Angular itself. But you don't want your app to have globals going wild. So imagine you have code like this, where I've got a controller. And in this controller, there are actually two global variables. Well, three. Anybody tell me what the three variables, global variables are? 
App Angular and Avenger Detail. Yep. Angular I'm okay with. App, I've declared it. Why is it a global, John? Because there's no scope here. There's no closure. The closure is the global namespace. So what happens when I use app somewhere else in my app? It better be the same kind of instance, right? What if I pull in third-party code when my team members or somebody else wrote and they use an app variable? It's an error, right? No. No. Last in wins. That's fun. It's awesome when you name a variable the same as somebody else and you don't know why. What about Avenger Detail? Same thing. The function is a global. It can be used anywhere. Build a large-scale app, you're going to get hundreds of these easily. And they're going to stay in memory. That's fun. Go check out your uh, browser and look, put a breakpoint in your code and just look at any one point at all of the global variables that are in your browser at any one time. There are over a thousand generally. The ones you didn't even create. So when you add to this mess, what, what the uh, browser actually does, it looks for variables, it says, I'm going to look in my closure first, inside my function. If I can't find that variable, I'm going to go out to the next closure, to the next, to the next all the way until it gets out to the global namespace. When it gets out to the global namespace, it then looks through everything to find what it's looking for. So imagine that you've lost a toy in your house. Your child says, Dad, Mom, I can't find my toy. The toy is probably this big, usually. <laughs> you say, well, OK, let's go look for it. First you look in the drawer where they usually keep it. Not there, I'm going to look on their dresser. Not there, I'm going to look in their room. Not there, let's check upstairs. Kind of get the point? Is that efficient? No. So you want to make sure you contain these babies. So how do you do that? You use something called an iffy, which ironically is my oldest daughter's favorite toy name. So an iffy is an immediately invoked function expression. It allows you to basically wrap JavaScript code in a closure and run it right away. So here what I'm saying is the same code I had before, except I'm wrapping it in this function. And this function does magic for me. It says, Go ahead and define that thing and then run it. Don't forget those last two parentheses at the end. That's another common thing I see people do. John, I put it in an iffy and it ain't working. Nothing's happening. Well, because you got to put the end ones on there. So the first two tell it, close this thing in. The last two at the very end, right before that semicolon, are telling it, now run this code. And after this code runs, it says, OK, you've left everything inside this closure. Therefore, all the variables are going to clean themselves up. No global namespace issues. When you get to ECMAScript 6, there's things called modules, which will actually help you avoid this entirely, which is kind of cool. But without that, this is what we do. So we've got three to go. Uh, dependency injections thing I've been playing with a lot lately. It's been a lot of fun. And one of the coolest things about Angular is it allows you to create these different separated aspects in your application. So you can work on one feature, you work on another, somebody can work on an exception handling block, someone can work on a logging service, and you just plug them in. You tell it who's going to be able to depend on who, and those dependencies just work. So here, we've got a controller, and that controller needs to talk to some data service. So we just inject the data service. As long as we've named it data service, we're good. And it is case sensitive, it's JavaScript. And common is also a service that we could use, maybe for common features or maybe uh, profiles for users or something. There's always some common functions every app has. But what happens when I minify this code using like Uglify JS? Common and data service might become A and B, or actually more realistically become like N and O. Or their, their letter naming structure is bizarre. It just minifies and compress everything. Minification gets rid of white space, comments, and does something called mangling. It'll mangle all of your variable names that it can. So it'll look through your function called dashboard and see common and data service. Let's say it calls them A and B. It'll also map anywhere you use common and data service inside of the dashboard to A and B. No problem. Except Angular is going to look at the name of those variables, do a two string on them at runtime, and say, Go find the services called common and data service. But when you minify those to A and B, it's going to look for a service called A or B. And you're going to get this really awesome error that says injector module cannot be found. And you're going to go, I don't know what that means. So we want to write minification safe code. And there's a couple ways to do this. One is to use this array syntax. Here we're telling Angular a hint. We're saying, 
go ahead, map the parameters for this object, in this case a controller, to what these strings are. And it's very important that the things in the strings are exactly the name of the services that you're looking for. In this case, you could name the variables in the dashboard A and B if you wanted to yourself. Because Angular is going to go find it using the string names. Again, another little common technique, one of the reasons I don't like this particular array syntax is because the array syntax is list all your, uh, your dependencies, and then the last one's going to be the actual function. So I see a lot of mistakes where people will actually put them all in strings, and they run their code, and they get some wacky errors. So all the parameters that lead up to be on the left-hand side are the names of the services that are dependencies, and the one on the right is the function. So one way to do that is to the inline guy, and when you minify that, they might turn into A and B, but that's okay. Why? Because now Angular knows how to go find them. Here's the technique I like. I like this technique because it explicitly breaks out, leave my code alone up top the way I wrote it, leave my code alone down here alone, just fine. Here's my hint on a separate line. Angular has a function called dollar sign inject. You put it on the name of the function, say dashboard dot, and I can do this again because of hoisting, dashboard dot inject, and that's the list of parameters. And one thing I like about this, another thing I like about it is, notice that the parameters match up. So now I can kind of see them right on top of each other. So if I ever change a parameter, which happens, then I know exactly right on top of it, I can see where those parameters match so I don't get in trouble. Uh, and this has bit me in the past when I didn't do this, or somebody adds in a parameter or they remove a parameter from the function and all of a sudden I forget to update the inject and then all of a sudden your code doesn't work. So you're helping Angular out with minification. It's not an Angular thing, it's a minification thing which you absolutely want to minify your code. So what's the best way to do it? There's about four other ways too. It doesn't matter, pick one. Just make sure you write minification safe code. You want to be consistent throughout your application and always look for a way that to me is easy to read and write. Somebody actually did a performance test in the mall and they found that the dollar sign inject was slightly faster than the array syntax. I believe them, I guess. Don't really care. The uh, performance results were so close it really, really cares. And if you'd like to, uh, some file templates to kind of help you write these things, if you're using WebStorm uh, up on this link, and again, I'll share these slides too. Here's a link that you can download file templates for WebStorm that'll write this kind of code. And if you use Visual Studio, you can go to sidewaffle.com and I wrote some templates for Angular there that do the same thing. So two topics left. John, I have a large application and my developers don't like to do minification safe code and injection. What do I do? I can't fire them. Task automation. Grunt or gulp? Anybody here use grunt or gulp? A couple of you. If you're not, you need to be. It is awesome. And you're working way too hard if you're not. Grunt and gulp, first of all, they have some of the coolest icons. I like to take the gulp and make the grunt guy drink it. These are JavaScript task runners. They will run through your JavaScript code and do a lot of things. One of the things they'll do for us is run through all the JavaScript code find every place that I've written a dependency and do the injection syntax for me. So all that stuff I just told you you had to remember to write, you won't have to write it if you use this. Wicked cool. So which one do you use, grunt or gulp? Grunt is pretty ubiquitous these days. It's been only around for two years, strangely. I mean, really in, in commonality. And it's configuration over code. So you write a lot of configuration and it's file-based. So every time it reads something in, does its uh, dependency injection annotations, writes it out to a temporary place on your file, hard drive, maybe it then reads it back in, does uglification, minification, writes it back out, kind of goes in and out a lot. Um, and there's a lot of plugins for it up on NPM, the node package module. Gulp is very similar, but now just a little less time, but it's code over configuration. Meaning you can write code that actually says, take this file, do this to it, then do that, then do that, then do that, and then when you're done, write it out. So instead of writing it out to the disk each time, it's actually streaming it through a pipeline. I happen to prefer Gulp, and since I don't have time to show both, I'm just going to show one. But there's a task for Gulp called ng-annotate. And what you do is you can help 
your code out. Instead of writing the inj inject syntax, you can just write this comment of at ng inject above anything you want to get uh, minification safe injections. So you write that little comment, and then when you run this gulp or grunt task over it, it'll run through and it'll fix that code and write that little inject statement I did earlier for you in all your code, which is really, really cool. This has actually saved me because I, write, I used to write all my injects myself. I said, nah, it's not such a big deal. I use file templates. And there were places I still got bit by just leaving it out or deleting it by accident. Or maybe my injection list, I wrote in A, B, and C, but the parameters are A, B, C, and D. I forgot one. So let's take a look at that guy. All right, so over in Sublime, and this is all back up on that site as well, you'll see a folder in here called Gulp, and you'll see a file called the Gulp file. And there's a bunch of tasks in here, one of which is ng annotate. So what I do with Gulp is I first say, go ahead and require Gulp. In Node, this is Node syntax, you just say require Gulp. That means go get Gulp. It's like an import or a using statement. Then you can also import files, which is cool. So I actually put like, uh, you know, where are my files located in this JSON file? So by using a slash syntax, just go out and find the file called package.json. So if I look for that, uh, package.json, you can see down here, scroll down, like where's my code located? I put it in this property called paths. And then I keep going down, then I define a task using gulp, if I can scroll. I define a task called ng annotate test. And what I'm doing is saying, go ahead and get the source out of this location, package paths JS. So I go back over here. That is actually this right there. I'm saying, go get all the files that start with module.js or .js and ignore this one file called spaghetti because John was screwing around one day and that's not really part of the project. Get all those, pipe that into this plugin called ng annotate. And you can also tell it to use single quotes if you want. And then just for fun, let's rename those to the same names but called dot annotated, just so we can see them side by side. And let's stick them all in this destination called App Avengers. So let's do that. And what I've done here is said for now, just do the Avengers file and output it here. So let's go find the Avengers file. Here it is. Let's get rid of this inject statement. And notice now I've got no dependency injection. I've got this little hint up top. And there's data service and logger. And there's my functions down below. Now when I go out to terminal, I would type in here. Let me clear that up. I'll say gulp ng annotate test. And there she is. Let's go back over to Sublime. And up in here. Oh, that's right, I did it in place. Now we see an Avengers annotated. Let's open him up. Where did that file go? Oh, there it is. So here's my inject. Looks like nothing changed. Let's flip between the two. Nothing's different, right? Look what's at the bottom. It stuck that in for me. Woo! Pretty cool. All right, let's try this again. Let's say I, dis I wanted to keep this line in there because somebody really likes doing it on my team and just adding them in themselves. Let's go ahead and delete this annotated file. Now let's run it again. Notice how fast it is too. Now I ran it again. It left mine in there. It did not put one at the bottom. So it's smart enough to see, okay, I see what you're doing. You're playing games with me. All right. <laughs> now let's take that out. And now let's take out the hint. Sometimes you don't even need to give it a hint. So now you've got somebody in your team's a real rebel. They're like, I'm just going to ignore minification safe code because I don't like it. I like to cause problems in people's lives. So here's my code, no minification. We'll go run it. We'll go open up the annotated file. And bam, right at the bottom. So there are places that it won't do it. And that's when you need that comment. I'll show you one of them. But in controllers, it's perfectly fine. Question? So what if you get somebody who likes to put it in there but screws it up and has an inject statement that's wrong and doesn't match? Like they you fire them then. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I think you put an inject statement in it's wrong. It's, yeah, it's bad. Uh, well, let's hope it's not that smart. No, it's not that smart. It's definitely not that smart. <laughs> what if for somebody put bad code in your code and does like x divided by zero? No, won't do that either. You can write your own extension to remove that and add the variable. Okay. Yes, you could. <laughs> it's actually getting pretty good. So I ran some code the other day with it, and it put a second inject in it, and I tried to figure out why. It's because I screwed up my inject. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, I actually filed a bug on it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I did bad. At least I didn't push it in. So let's go look at another example. Let's say you want to do injection in a more complex scenario. Where is a complex scenario, John? This is a small app, but I believe in core config. Yeah, here we go. Look at this, baby. I've got this thing that I'm going to add to every route. It says, before I go to every route, there's a thing called a route resolver. So if you ever want to run code before you go to a screen or controller, you can use a route resolver. Well, a route resolver says, I'm going to go run some code before you crank up the screen. And to do that, I create this function. You can name it whatever you want. I call mine ready. And you can create multiple ones. I can create one called foo. And you know, have a function here, and it's going to run the foo resolver and the ready resolver. But what if your route resolver needs to have injection? Well, nested deep inside these objects, it's not going to see that this is a controller, a directive, a service. The, you know, the ng annotate test isn't really going to figure out that this is actually an Angular parameter. So what you can do is pass in this comment. And that comment will say, OK, you need to inject and help me out here and find this place so I can leave this called data service. Or it'll put the inject syntax in there, so which is actually what it does. So it'll actually create the inject syntax for you, so then you can have minification safe code. Without this, it would minify this variable, and it would tell you you have a module injection error, because it would probably call this A, and it would be A.ready, and then minified code. And then your code would run, and you'd say have an injection error, and you go where, and it would go, I'm not telling. And then you go hunting and pecking for hours, and it's just not fun, believe me. So we don't do that, and it rewrites the code like this, what's in the comments below. It says, OK, I'll go ahead and rewrite it for you. I'll find a way to protect you from yourself, John. And it does do that. So let's run another task called gulp, what's it called, gulp stage? Ah, hold on. Let's go inside the gulp file. Let's find stage. Do, 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 do. Here's like a full blown, let's do some CI, man. I have a task called stage. That task depends upon writing my JavaScript, my vendor JavaScript, my CSS, my vendor CSS, my images, my fonts, running unit tests, and a whole bunch of other things. So it's going to run all those dependencies, build everything up, and then shove it out to production for me. So that task can do all that. And one of these guys is running header. And header doesn't exist anymore. Let's find him. Find. Who's using header? Maybe it's in my common file. Nope. So why are you broken? Let's try you again. Well, there's another way to solve this. Cannot find module gulp header. Let's npm install gulp header. You didn't see this. This did not happen. Great thing about npm, as long as you have an internet connection, you can install any module you want to as you go. The gulp header module actually allows you to create like headers inside your files. Let's try this again. Hey, look, it's working. So it's bundling my CSS, my fonts, and compressing my images, running my unit tests, which always pass, and creating all my index HTML. Because your index HTML looks different in dev than it does in production, right? Because in dev, you've got like 50,000 JavaScript files. In production, you've got one minified file. <coughs> so when I did that, what was the point of that, John? Hey, I'm really glad you asked. So the point of that was I created this build folder. In the build folder, I created a file called all min.js. So if we now go look for a function called ready, look at that. You see that code? Starting with ready. Then it says ready colon injection safe code data service function. And it changed data service to n. Minification changed that to an n on me. 
This is that same code we just saw in the config file right here. It took that code and said, ooh, you want me to inject safe it? No problem. I'll go do that for you because I like you. And then it opened up that baby right there. If you don't do this, it'll just say, I could not find module A for your injection. You're going to go, what is module A or N? Actually, it's N. You have to go searching through your minified code to figure out what the problem is. Boy, that's fun to do on a Sunday night. So, moral of the story, use ng annotate. There's another plugin written by one of the guys in the Angular team called ng-min. It is the predecessor to this. Um, so Brian Ford wrote ng-min, another guy wrote ng-annotate, actually does everything ng-min does plus some additional things. Uh, and actually, uh, Brian Ford on his blog wrote deprecated an ng-min. So if you were using ng-min before, use ng-annotate now. Uh, even he has now said, go ahead and use this one. It's the beauty of open source. So, with one minute left, last thing I want to talk about was you can do so much more with gulp and grunt, like unit testing and a bunch of other things. I'll show you those in a moment. Uh, you can find all these demos again up at ng-demos. And I hope you guys had a really good time here, but let's see my unit test before we go. So people say, how do you do unit tests? I don't like writing them, but I do them. And inside my client folder, I've got a test folder. By the way, for production sites, I've been, I do it both ways. Sometimes I create a test folder for all my tests. Sometimes I put the tests side by side with my files. For teams that are just learning how to do unit testing, I put them side by side with the files. Why? Because if I'm in my code and I see a controller and I see a spec right next to it, it's kind of in my face to write the test. So when people are new to writing tests, it kind of forces them to think about it more. When they're off in their own folder, you know, more mature teams can kind of do that and kind of be disciplined. So here's a very simple uh, set of tests in Angular for a controller. And what I do is basically I pulled in something called Karma. Karma will run my tests automatically for me. And I'll also use something called Mocha. Mocha is my testing framework. There's another one called Jasmine. They're both great. And what I can do is say, all right, inject all these things into my project. Angular has these helpers, dollar sign controller, dollar sign HP backend, to help you do unit testing. And I grab those in. And one of the cool things that nobody tells you is, if you want to go grab a service in a test, if you separate it with these underscores in the beginning and the end, Angular says, I'll strip those off and go find that service. And the cool thing about that is, I want to go get the controller service. It's actually called controller like that. But if you want to set it to a local variable, you no longer have to rename the variables. If I had done this without the underscores, that'll work. But then I'd have to name this something like, you know, controller thing. And then you have a different variable name throughout. By doing it this way, you actually get to keep the name of the actual service in your code, which is kind of cool. So you can inject your own services too, like Toaster, something I wrote, or the data service. This HTTP backend allows you to basically say, when you see a get to this URL, respond to the 200, just so it knows, because I'm going to be testing that. Flush says, go ahead and flush out all the backend requests. You can also stub different objects. I'm saying when you see the data service dot get Avengers function get called, instead of actually calling it, I don't want to do that. I want to make a unit test. So I'm mocking my data service and saying, keep the real data service, but if they call get Avengers, get my mock data. And that just returns a JSON object. So that way I can run it without running my server. And I keep doing that for other data objects. And then I create a new instance of a controller. One thing nobody tells you again is, inside your tests, the digest cycle isn't running because there is no DOM. So inside your tests, when you do a lot of things, and when you're done with your test, you're going to want to run this root scope apply. That says, run the digest cycle so Angular knows everything's there. Do not do that in real code. Once you set that up, my tests are dead simple. It should have an Avengers controller. If that one fails, I'm in trouble. It should have a title of Avengers. There should be five. Why five? Because my mock data had five. And then at the end, just verify there's no additional requests that actually happened. Nothing else happened I didn't expect. So then you can go into Gulp. And at the end of Gulp, we'll look for test. What I do down here is I pipe in the Karma plugin. 
I tell it where that configuration file is, and it's a pretty standard file. You can grab it off my site. You can tell it to run once, or I can put in watch. And if I put in watch, it'll run and then stay open and wait for a file to change and run it again. So let's watch that. So I'm back here. Now I'm going to type in gulp test. It's going to run all my tests. And hopefully they all pass. 36 of 36 passed. Yippee! So now let's do this. Let's move him over here. Let's go back into my code. Let's open up the Avengers controller. We'll move him side by side. And I'm typing in size like font 20,000. And I'll type in vm.papa equals hello. Yes, I know I am over time. And I type that. Watch what happens I press save. My test ran. Oops. Now I had a problem. So, oh, because I did vpapa minus. Look at that. There we go. So we've got all these guys in here. They're all happy. Everything's wonderful. I can delete my bad code, run my tests, and now my tests pass. So again, you want to come out to this site, grab the source code. Uh, I will go ahead and put the deck up there online as well. And for those of you who are into Pluralsight, I have a course coming out that covers this and a ton of other things called Angular Patterns Clean Code uh, later this month. Um, should be up there on the site, hopefully by the end of the month, depending on how long it takes them to get there. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hope you had a good weekend.